Jehovah's Witnesses released this Caleb and Sophia video a little while back. It was a response to the accusation that they were mishandling CSA cases, you know, child abuse cases. So listen to what this Caleb and Sophia video is about, and we're going to talk about why they needed to release this in the first place. Children, Jehovah wants you to be happy and keep you safe. But some people want to do bad things to you. So Jehovah gave you a conscience. Let me explain what's so deeply wrong about this and why it's not helpful at all. There are steps to grooming a kid, okay? Now, Jehovah's Witnesses may or may not know this. I don't know. But my FBI agent is looking at my uh, browser history like, what's this dude up to? <laughs> uh, steps to groom a child. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, when a child is attacked, it's somebody that they know and that they're close to, a family member, for example. But in the odd case, it's not a family member. It most definitely doesn't happen like this. A kid is on a playground and is running and their alarm bells go off. If their alarm bells go off, then the predator did not do what they intended to do correctly. Because there are steps that predators take to prey on vulnerable people so that these alarm bells don't go off, right? It, there's an acronym for it. I don't remember what it is, but here's the, the basic rundown of how it works. Identifying and targeting a victim. Any child or teen may be a potential victim. Some predators may target youth with certain coexisting factors, such as vulnerable parents, to facilitate the crime. Gaining trust and access. This part's important because it prevents those alarm bells from going off. The kid is none the wiser. Playing a role in the child's life. The perpetrator may manipulate the relationship, so it appears he or she is the only one who fully understands or meets the child's needs in a particular way. Isolating the child. Offering the child rides or taking, that, or taking them out of his or her surroundings is one way that the perpetrator may separate them from others and gain access to the child alone creating secrecy around the relationship. The perpetrator may reinforce the special connection with the victim when they are alone or through private communication with the victim, such as letters, emails, text messages. And it, it just goes downhill from there. That's part, that's, that's the grooming process, right? So Jehovah's Witnesses being accused of mishandling CSA cases and then releasing this video in response just shows how absurd and nonsensical they are in the first place. It shows that they had no idea what the, the problem even was. If there are alarm bells going off, then something went wrong along the line for this predator. This is not the standard process that predators take. This is not how grooming works. This is well understood. It's a well understood process. So this is Jehovah's Witnesses trying to correct the problem by appealing to kids' consciences and telling them to watch for red flags like a dark man coming into a playground and hovering over them ominously. Quack. Joke. Some people want to do bad things to you. So Jehovah gave you a conscience. It's like an alarm system that helps you to know right from wrong. The goal is to shut down that alarm system in cases where predators are preying on kids. It will protect you from danger. So, Mommy and I will help you test your alarm system. Ready? What if someone tells you something that makes you feel uncomfortable or scares you? What do you do? I'm not sure, but that's weird. Stop! This isn't how it works. Again, it's always somebody that's trusted that does this kind of thing. They build trust with kids intentionally to break down that sense of barrier to break down the uncomfortability they may feel. It's all very intentional. Children are the most vulnerable among us because they're not emotionally or mentally developed yet. And as a pseudo-government, as Jehovah's Witnesses want to be, this is the best they've got to correct the problem of mishandling CSA cases? I'll talk about why it's a problem in the first place when we're done with this Caleb and Sophia video, but this is absurd. This isn't helping anybody with anything. It, in fact, it's putting the onus on the kid. That shouldn't be the case. 
Yeah, every parent should tell their kid, watch out for questionable weird things. Listen to your alarm bells. Okay, sure. Jehovah's Witnesses shouldn't be using this as their solution. I'll tell you what solutions Jehovah's Witnesses should implement in a minute that, that would completely solve this issue so they wouldn't be accused of this anymore. Very good. Tell them to stop it. And you tell mom and daddy. No matter what someone tells you, never keep a secret from us. What if they ask you to do something that makes you feel uncomfortable? I would say no. You're right. You should say no and walk away. What if they try to touch you where they shouldn't? I wouldn't let them. I'd get out of there. Good. See, that's the issue. It, it doesn't work this way. This is like heartbreaking that this is like the solution they're going to or that they're even saying any of this to kids. When there are real world, actual solutions Jehovah's Witnesses could implement. And instead of implementing those solutions, what are they doing? They are fighting it with lawyers. They have lawyers battling this out in court so they don't have to implement these solutions that I'm talking about. They are actually fighting this in court. And meanwhile, telling kids, if somebody does something you don't like, don't let them. Really. Even if it's an adult you know and trust, you that's the vast majority of cases should say no and run away and you should yell stop doing that i'm gonna tell on you <laughs> stop, stop doing, doing that, that. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna tell, tell on you, you. the world this is a joke dude i just this is simply disgusting man the world can be a scary place but you are never alone remember you have your conscience what he said there, the world can be a scary place, was a subtle hint at the fact that it's the world that does this, not Jehovah's Witnesses. These problems arise from people who are trying to infiltrate and cause problems, not actually people who love Jehovah. They call outsiders members of the world, quote unquote. Now, Jehovah's people would never do something like that. Just reinforcing the problem in the first place. They are trained to implicitly trust anybody within this religion, no matter what. This is the problem. And that will love you. And you have Jehovah. <laughs> so anyway, let's talk about this issue. Why is this a problem in the first place? What's the deal with this? This is Robert Lucioni. He is apparently a, a governing body helper. He's the kind of person that would be next in line to be on the governing body if they were taking entries. Well, a while back, I discovered this video on the XJW subreddit recently. This is from 2020, I believe. He talked about apostates and ex-Jehovah's Witnesses and how evil they are, and I wanted to talk about it. Let's see what he had to say about apostates and non-Jehovah's Witnesses in general. It's actually pretty interesting. And uh, we're also going to talk about Caleb and Sophia and how it relates to what he's saying, because boy, does it get wild. So this guy just went through a big, long explanation of how Jesus was misrepresented by the people in the Bible. And now he's going to apply it to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses and how mistreated these poor people are. These martyrs, these filthy rich Millionaire martyrs. Poor guys, huh? Okay, let's hear it. Let's see what he has to say. Well, today, wicked men and imposters use exactly the same techniques, and it's only going to get worse. Uh, they use lies and misrepresentation. They lie about how we deal with child abusers, how we care for the victims of child abuse. They twist statements that are made. Okay, interesting point. Let's talk about that. Is that true? Do apostates, do, uh, let me, really, that's who they're talking about, me, because I identify as an apostate against Jehovah's Witnesses, right? I was once a member, I'm no longer a member because I am disgusted by the way this organization acts. Do I twist an explanation of how they act? Jehovah's Witnesses have something called an elder's handbook, okay? Now, elders are basically like line managers. If you're starting from zero with this religion, have no idea what it's about or how it operates. I'll, I'll try to give you basics. There are usually somewhere around, I don't know, 10 to 12 elders for every 150 people in a congregation. Not very many. Now, they don't have to be older. 
I've known elders that were as young as 25 years old. Uh, not very common, but it does happen from time to time. The most holy of the most holy, right? Well, there are these books called the Elder's Handbook. I think they're called Shepherd the Flock of God. That's the name of the book. And these are heavily protected secrets. This is the kind of thing that you're not supposed to leave in a room alone unless it's in a locked case. This is why Jehovah's Witness elders carry around briefcases with locks on them. Even your wife. You can't even let your wife near it. It says you can have it spiral bound if you choose, but you have to have another elder do the spiral bounding and you have to stand there and watch the entire process if you do. I mean, they take this real seriously. And I have a copy. I have a few copies. So let's take a look at what they say in, in this book, okay? All of this CSA stuff came up back in, uh, I don't know, a few years ago. Because as it turns out, in the 1991 edition of the Shepherd the Flock of God book or whatever, the Elder's Handbook, it didn't say a single word about how to handle CSA cases or almost nothing about it. Let's just find out. Let's search it. Let's see what it says exactly. Okay, the uh, 1991 version of this book says that it only has reference to CSA in one spot, page 126. The problem is they had this thing called the two witness rule. They still have this, by the by. It's from the Bible originally. It was to protect people from, like, contracts falling flat, right? Like, you sell somebody this donkey... And they claim, oh, he never gave me the money for it. So you need at least two witnesses there to witness the signing of the contract, the trading of money and the goods and everything else, or it doesn't count. It's like it didn't happen. Of course, this is before video cameras or anything, right? That was the two witness rule. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses apply the two witness rule to CSA cases. There have to be two witnesses or two victims, or it's like it didn't happen. So what was happening, this is a real case that really happened and was brought to court and Jehovah's Witnesses lost a multi-million dollar suit because this happened. A guy, multiple people, were going to new congregations. They were committing CSA. They were committing a crime. It was reported to the elders, but there was nothing the elders could do because there wasn't a second victim or a second witness. So they, it, it's like nothing happened. So the guy moves to a new congregation since the book says there have to be two witnesses for action to take place, the elders in that congregation were bound by Jehovah's Witness organization to say nothing to anybody, like it never happened. He would reoffend in the new congregation, and it would be a cycle that played over and over and over again, 26 times or something like that for this one guy. And again, this happened with multiple people, and Jehovah's Witnesses mishandled this so grossly, they lost multiple multi-million dollar lawsuits they lost so many lawsuits to this because they mishandled this so badly that they had to sell their headquarters in brooklyn new york for 1.3 billion dollars roughly we we estimate and build a new one with their slave labor they've got or i get you know volunteer labor whatever anyway uh it was bad it was bad and what did they do in response they rewrote the elder's manual. They rewrote the book. They added new sections in to kind of correct for this little issue. So unequivocally, without question, they absolutely had a problem with CSA and how they handled it. The 1991 book, all the way up until the next edition, which is written in 2010, was terrible, awful. It was unhelpful. It led to actual CSA taking place. By the way, you can look even earlier than the 91 book. I think they had a 1974 elders book that was even worse. I just didn't want to pull that one up right now. But you can look in it, and it has bad stuff. The thing is, with these people, they want to be a pseudo-government. They don't just want to be a church. They expect the world to fall it, sometime in the near future. And when the world falls, they're going to step in for Jehovah's Witnesses and be the government they are trying to set up a government right now they have been for years for decades the, this is something that needs to be worked out okay here you go uh if wrongdoing has not been established this is a 2010 version of the elders handbook right this is their answer to if csa is accused 
If wrongdoing has not been established, but serious questions have been raised, the body of elders should appoint two elders to investigate the matter promptly. For example, there may be just one witness. If so, it would be loving for the witness first to confront the accused and encourage him to take the initiative to approach the elders. Really. You want a six-year-old kid to approach the person, the, the, the perpetrator, and ask them to talk to the elders for spiritual help? Are you kidding me? This is a joke, right? The elders can then allow the accused a few days to approach them. For the witness by himself to confront the accused may not be advisable in all cases. For example, if the witness and the accused were involved in immorality together, or if the witness was a victim of or by the accused, or is a child and the victim of CSA. Okay, all right, so they, they put a little addendum in there for kids, that's fair. You know, they shouldn't have even had this in here, honestly. They shouldn't have even, it shouldn't be on the person, the, the victim, to approach the, the victimizer. It's absurd that they'd have that in there in the first place, anyway. Whether the witness approaches the accused or not, the two elders appointed should speak with the accused regarding the accusation. If the accused denies the accusation, okay, here are the steps they take. This happens every time. Okay, this is going to happen inevitably. What's the next step? The investigating elder should try to arrange a meeting with him and the accuser together. Are you kidding me? Six-year-old kid was just taken advantage of by a predator, and you want to put them in the same room as the, the predator? Again, really? Okay, not the choice I'd make, but it's a choice, I suppose. Note, if the accusation involves CSA and the victim is currently a minor, the elder should contact the branch office before arranging a meeting with the child and the alleged abuser. It doesn't say if they're a child, don't hold the meeting. It says, tell us first and then do it. This is the correction, okay? They faced lawsuits over this that they lost millions of dollars. And in response to correct the problem, they wrote this. This is a joke. If the accuser or the accused is unwilling to meet with the elders, or if the accused continues to deny the accusation, of a single witness and the wrongdoing is not established, there's that one witness thing, you know, the two witness rule, the elders will leave matters in Jehovah's hands. Real, okay, so just whack it, just, okay. I guess he denied it, so we're gonna move on with our lives. That's what that is, that's what they said. We're gonna get the six-year-old child in a room with this grown man, and we're going to ask him if he did it. And if he says no, okay, we're just gonna let things work themselves out say nothing to anybody again this is the correction this is the this is fixing the problem that led to millions of dollars in lawsuits all right well i hear you saying to yourself the next edition 10 years later couldn't possibly be that bad right 2021 edition of shepherd the flock of god the 2021 edition has the exact same section copied and pasted word for word as the 2010 edition, but they have an additional section here, I believe. So they have a new section titled Legal Considerations. CSA is a crime. In some jurisdictions, individuals who learn of an allegation of CSA may be obligated by law to report the allegation to the secular authorities. Yeah, that was another problem with the 2010 and the 1991 and the 1974 edition of this book. Elders were pretending this never happened, of course, right? It says if there aren't two witnesses, pretend it never happened. And that means they weren't calling the police. They were not involving secular authorities. If they could verify that it took place, then they would call the authorities most of the time. But the elders book all the way up until a few years ago specifically instructed them to pretend it didn't happen. So the new edition 2021, okay, this organization's existed for 150 years. And just now, just now, 2021, they added this addendum. You may be obligated by law. Not call the cops if you hear about this, but you might be obligated to call the cops, okay? To ensure elders comply with CSA reporting laws, two elders should immediately call the legal department for legal advice when the elders learn of an accusation. Oh, not just call the cops, but call our legal department so that we don't look bad, so we can handle any lawsuits or get a jump on this or whatever. That, again, that's an option, I suppose. This is supposed to be an organization inspired by God. 
that gets its information from God, that models its government after what God wanted. And instead of calling the f cops when something like this happens, they told their people to call their legal department so they don't get sued again for mishandling it. And they released a Caleb and Sophia video on the subject. Genius. That's genius. That's, a, that's an awesome idea. Fantastic. Great way to do it. Put the onus on the kid and do basically nothing else. Okay. So that was the first thing in the list that this guy gave us that, that, that's slanderous, that apostates are lying about. I'm sorry, man. Look, if you don't want to be accused of mishandling this stuff, don't mishandle this stuff, okay? You have control over 8.5 million people. Million. What percentage of those people are children? And what's more, what percentage are suffering at the hands of somebody who is taking advantage of them? It's not zero. How are you going to handle that when it's placed at your doorstep? The answer unequivocally is have the elders who find out about this call the legal department, not the police, the legal department. Now, to be fair, they did enter an addendum in that 2021 version of the elders handbook that says you are perfectly free to call the police if you want. We are not telling you not to call the police. If you choose to do that, then okay. That's not what I wanted. I don't know what they think they're doing, but the the line should have been, call the police no matter what. I don't care what goal they were trying to accomplish, what ends they were trying to reach. Call the cops if you hear about this, okay? Elders are not investigators. They're poor fools who work two jobs most of the time and then do their work for Jehovah's Witnesses on top of all of that. They don't have time to dig into people's personal lives. And what's more, they shouldn't be doing that anyways. Police have the resources of the state at their disposal. They have forensics that they can do. They have trained detectives who can question people and know exactly how to conduct an interrogation and can get to the bottom of things. Elders are these poor guys that, you know, have too much on their plate already, are working their nuts off because you told them that going to college was evil. So now they have to work at Burger King for the rest of their fucking life. That's what an elder is. We promote divine education. We believe it to be superior because it leads to everlasting life. So with schools of higher education and they start you off there you, you'd be going for another thing but you you have philosophy one you have philosophy two and then all of a sudden it gets in there and the intellectual gripping of the mind uh, very hard to recover from that's what an elder is not an investigator call the cops okay so listen to what he has to say again about the accusations at apostates level at them. They lie about how we deal with child abusers, how we care for the victims of child abuse. They care for them by losing lawsuits and paying them millions of dollars. So I have no complaints about that one. <laughs> I just wish they would correct their terrible, terrible elders handbook. They could just put an addendum in that says, call the cops if you hear about this. No questions asked. This is an order from the governing body, from Jehovah himself. Don't consider this something that you have a choice in doing. You must call the police. They could put that in because the culture is one where you don't involve outside authorities. Let's just listen to the whole statement and we'll address a few of these things. They twist statements that are made regarding our stand on blood, loyalty to families, disfellowshipping. They capitalize on what they perceive as errors. Perhaps dogmatic statements we made in the past regarding a Bible prophecy or or understanding of the time of the end, and then we later changed it. Mm, yeah, that's painful. Uh, well, yeah, you you did make some dogmatic statements. You claimed in 1914 Jesus came back, and you also claimed the end would come before the people who were alive in 1914 died. Well, guess what? That was a hundred and something years ago, right? <laughs> Anybody still alive from that era? They outright claimed Armageddon would be here before people who saw 1914 died. And then when that didn't happen, when it was obvious they had to correct their errors, they said, 
what we meant was anybody who was alive during the time that anybody who was alive during the time that 1914 took place. So basically, anybody who was a contemporary of someone who was alive in 1914. It was absurd from top to bottom, and they bought themselves about 20 years at best. They just stepped in it hard. They just made a huge mess out of everything, and now they have to say statements like this. Bible prophecy or, or understanding of the time of the end, and then we later changed it. Yeah, that's their second generation teaching they're talking about. Yeah, that was a mistake on your part. And about the other stuff? Regarding our stand on blood, loyalty to families, disfellowshipping. Yeah, that, those things disgust me too. Absolutely. They misinterpret what the Bible says about blood transfusions. They don't know what it means. They have no idea what it's talking about, apparently. Because it specifically says in the Bible, do not eat blood, as in devour. Take in through your mouth and into your stomach. That's what the word actually means in the Bible. If you look at the interlinear version of the Bible. Jehovah's Witnesses act as though nobody can read Hebrew except for them, and they know exactly what the original word said, and you don't, so you just have to take their word for it. No, I have something called an interlinear Bible that I can just pull up on the, the electric Google machine over here and find out what that word was. I mean, this isn't even touching the, uh, the other statement that he made about disfellowshipping and shunning and how they treat people. I obviously have a deep problem with that one. This is the verse, Leviticus 17.10. They use this to justify blood transfusions or banning blood transfusions. This is the NIV translation. I will set my face against any Israelite or, or any foreigner residing among them who eats blood, and I will cut them off from the people. Back in the, you know, the Old Testament era, the rabbis were also the doctors of the civilization, so they put a bunch of bans on certain things that tended to spread disease, like eating blood or eating pork. That's why those things were banned. So let's look at the interlinear version. This is a word for word direct translation from the original language from right to left, because of course this language was written from right to left. Reading the word groupings, it says, from among his people, any blood, and I will set my face against that person who eats blood and will cut him off and whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you who eats. So that, that wasn't arranged for English readers, obviously, but the word is eats. So let's look. Yokal is the word, I believe. That's how it's... I'm butchering how it's pronounced, I'm sure, but that's what the word is. In other contexts, it's used as devour. He shall devour. He devours. No foreigner is to eat of it. Through the mouth and into the stomach. God never said anything about not taking life-saving blood transfusions. He didn't say don't take it into your body to save your life. He said don't eat it. And what's more, this is Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled the old law, right? We should be done with this. Why are they hyper-focused on what the Old Testament says and misinterpreting it, which is thus leading to people's death? How many people have died from not getting blood transfusions. We can estimate because they used to run a segment in their watchtowers about, you know, these people giving their lives for Jehovah by not getting blood transfusions until they realized how tacky that was. Tacky probably isn't the right word here. Disgusting might be the right word. And they stopped doing that. So we can estimate roughly if we scale it up and, and stuff like that. Just evil, disgusting shit, honestly. And as far as how they treat disfellowship people, the shunning thing, this is just a flat-out control method. The Bible does not endorse shunning. The verse they use to endorse shunning is in the book of Corinthians. It was 1 Corinthians 5, 9, and here's the context to it. Paul, this is the verse that Jehovah's Witnesses use to justify shunning people. Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthian congregation, and said, if somebody does one of these things, you shouldn't eat with him. You should shun him. You should cut him out of the congregation, right? I wrote to you my letter not to associate with immoral people, with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, drunkard, swindler. Don't even eat with such people. That's the verse Jehovah's Witnesses used to justify shunning people, okay? Only this was a 
letter to the Corinthian congregation who didn't know how to handle a case of somebody doing this stuff. And the, the Corinthian congregation wrote a letter back and said, rethink what you just told us because this is too hard on the person and it's too hard on the congregation. We don't want to shun. This is terrible. Jehovah's Witnesses conveniently leave out the verse in 2 Corinthians where Paul reverses it and says, you know what, you're right. I don't want to cause undue hardship. Let's not do shunning. Paul started as a shunner, wanted to do shunning, and then corrected his path in the very next book. But Jehovah's Witnesses ignore that book entirely. You know why? Because they want shunning as a control mechanism. Because they want to use it to force people to stay under their thumb. Uh, regarding our stand on blood, loyalty to families, disfellowshipping. They capitalize on what they perceive as errors. These things are all blatant, flat-out errors. They mishandled CSA, obviously. Courts decided that they owed millions and mi tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions at this point, to the victims. They misinterpreted the verse on blood transfusions. They misinterpreted or completely ignored verses on shunning. And what was the other thing he said? It's dogmatic statements. We oh, yeah. And they most definitely got their dogmatic statements wrong about 1914, about contemporaries, the second generation. They got all that wrong. Unequivocally. This isn't me misinterpreting. This is you being wrong. Made in the past regarding a Bible prophecy or, or our understanding of the time of the end, and then we later changed it. They also put a negative spin on changes that they do not understand. See, why we simplified, did reassignments in 2015. Oh, no, we know exactly why you did those things. They did something called the master plan, right? So here's what happened. They were sued for uh, hundreds of millions of dollars over the course of like a 10-year period, like a lot of money, right? Then after losing these lawsuits, they institute something they call the master plan where they combine congregations there's something called overbooking with flights where an airline knows about 10% of people aren't going to show up for their flight. So since they don't want an empty airplane, they will overbook people. So the, instead of booking 100 seats and 100 people, they'll book 110 people. And they know 10 of those people won't show up and they'll still make their money. It'll be a full flight. Jehovah's Witnesses basically did that with Kingdom Halls. They combined them all together. They know only a certain number are going to show up. They staggered the meeting schedule so that multiple congregations could share the Kingdom Halls. And then they sold off all of the other extra Kingdom Halls that Jehovah's Witnesses had built in something called Quick Builds. I engaged in a bunch of Quick Builds when I was little. <clears throat> well, a couple. Then they even had to have other Jehovah's Witnesses build a new headquarters for them. And they sold off their Brooklyn headquarters, which has been there since the 1920s or 30s or something. Sold it for like $1.3 billion. You know why? Because they owed hundreds of millions of dollars in CSA uh, cases that they had to pay for. That's not negative spin. That's just very obviously what happened. 2015, all these CSA cases hit. You owe hundreds of millions, and now you're combining Kingdom Halls and selling them off. I don't understand why that's so controversial. It's not a negative spin. That's just what's happening. Did reassignments in 2015, and new explanations of the generation, changes at world headquarters. What's the result? Well, some are swayed by these things. Well, it's impossible not to be swayed. This is very obviously what was happening. They're stumbled. They're knocked down. It's too heavy for them to carry. How about us? How strong is our spiritual core? So he's telling, he's basically addressing all the accusations that were leveled at them by non Jehovah's Witnesses for the grotesque things that they did. And uh, he's trying to shut them down. He's trying to make Jehovah's Witnesses not listen to this stuff anymore. I'm sorry, man. It's just disgusting. And releasing a Caleb and Sophia video to address CSA to try to prevent it from happening instead of. Issuing an addendum to the 2021 Elder's Handbook, which they did, by the way. They released an addendum. Didn't make their situation any better with CSA. Instead of releasing an addendum that says, call the cops, no questions asked, just do it. Instead of doing that, they release these stupid videos, which honestly is a microcosm of the overall broader issue, isn't it? It is a 
perfect representation of the real problem here. You're releasing propaganda films that are not helping anything to address this situation. Instead of just doing the thing you were supposed to do from the beginning, tell them to call the cops. Anyway, that's Jehovah's Witnesses for you. They have no clue what the problem is, or if they do know the problem and they know the solution because they've been told that solution by the police and by the court system, they will fight it tooth and nail because they don't want to do what you told them to do. Simply because you told them that they need to tell their elders to call the police if they find out about this, they're not going to do it simply because you told them that. That's who we're dealing with. They're children. Anyway, let me know what you think about it in the comments. I think these people are absurd human beings and it just drives me up a wall that they refuse to take the most basic steps to protect people that they're supposed to be acting as a government for. It kills me, man. Tell me what you think.